what we discussed Wednesday night has been swirling around me ever since. I think I've become a bit obsessed with all of this what for me, anyway, is new information. I'm trying my best to process it into my mental framework, and I have to admit, I'm not sure it's working. I understand. I've held back some information for this very reason, not only for you, but also for those who will ultimately hear this. When we ended the last session we agreed to spend more time on the Grand Portal. Is that what you're referring to, or is it something else? It's all related. It's a very, very big picture, and broad timeline. Can you share it now? Let's take it one part at a time. With your questions, I hope it will all come clear, but I have to warn you that it will seem a little unwieldy or odd until the whole of it is out. Okay. Where do you want to start? I think we need to go back to the beginning to understand the true context of the Grand Portal. The Grand Portal is defined in the Wingmaker's materials as the irrefutable, scientific discovery of the human soul. Okay. Earth was and is a very unique planet. It was entirely of water originally. But what made it interesting to beings was the fact that its core enabled it to have a gravitational force that supported manifestation. What do you mean by manifestation? That it began to traverse from an interdimensional planet of sound frequencies to a planet of matter, a physical matter. Its gravity-producing core or nucleus was able to literally create the conditions that allowed it to materialize itself over eons of time. How do you know this history? There are records of this on the disk that was taken from the 23rd chamber at the ancient Aero site. But some of this we knew from other documents we've retrieved from the Sumerian record that have not been widely distributed. We've also had discussions with the Cordium that bear this out. So Earth started out as a water planet and it wasn't physical? Correct. This was when the Atlanteans lived within the planet. They were the race of beings that inhabited Earth at the time of its formation. The Anunnaki came to them and negotiated an agreement to allow the Anunnaki to mine a substance near the core of the planet that would be, in its essence, what today we would call gold. These races of beings known as the Atlanteans and Anunnaki were not three-dimensional. They didn't possess bodies as we think of them today. Their existence was contained in a different range of frequencies, what we would call higher dimensional frequencies. Why did they want gold? The Anunnaki required it. The exact reason is unknown, but it had something to do with the way that gold modulated the frequency of their body. Gold was an essence to their race. It held a property that was vital to their survival. The record is a little vague as to exactly why it was so important. But these records mention that their entire planet had 12 major cities and all of them were made of a semi-transparent gold. Even the Book of Revelations refers to this. Who are these beings? I mean, I've heard of the Atlanteans, but never the Anunnaki. They're a race of transdimensional beings. The Atlanteans were the only race of beings on Earth at that time, and they, the Anunnaki, sought permission to set up mining on Earth, which the Atlanteans agreed to. The ancient aerosite is known within the Wingmaker's materials as the extraterrestrial time capsule that was discovered in Chaco Canyon, New Mexico. Why? They didn't see any harm in helping the Anunnaki. They weren't a competitor because the Atlanteans were more numerous. The Atlanteans wanted to have an agreement with the Anunnaki if only to befriend them for their technology. Also, the gold mining was in an area of Earth that was of little consequence to them. I don't see how this relates to the Grand Portal. It's a long story, and we just started, but I promise I'll come to that in a bit. Okay, that's fine, I'll be patient. The Earth began to materialize more and more. It began to harden in a sense. The gold with it. The earth, and everything on it, was solidifying. The mining of the gold would soon become impossible for the Anunnaki, because they'd be unable to mine the gold if it were in a dense, physical state. Why not? Their bodies were etheric. They could not mine the gold if it was physical. They needed to have bodies that would be able to operate on earth and mine the gold. How quickly did this happen? I don't know. Our records don't stipulate the time scale, but I assume it was over tens of thousands of years. The point is that they needed to create a physical vessel like an astronaut would require a spacesuit to inhabit space. They tried hundreds of experiments and had the help of both the Atlanteans and Syrians. I assume this vessel is the human body? Yes, we call them physical uniforms sometimes. The wing makers refer to them as human instruments. So the Anunnaki created a physical body to mine gold. You mean like a robot or are you saying these were humans? No. These were the equivalent of ape men. They were pre-human by a long shot. But they were our predecessors. 
We sometimes refer to them as human 1.0. Oh, were they robots or biological? They were completely biological, but human 1.0s were not fully physical. They were partly ethric. You see, the Anunnaki and Syrians designed them to synchronize with the evolving densification of the Earth. So as the Earth solidified, so did the human instruments. If they were biological, did they have a soul? We wouldn't call them human if they did that. Remember I mentioned the Atlanteans? Yes. The Anunnaki and Syrians placed them, the Atlanteans, inside these human uniforms. These were very advanced beings, but apparently naive. They wanted to be in these ape men bodies and mine gold? No, that was not their interest at all. In fact, they allowed the Anunnaki to mine their gold, but as the earth began to solidify, they told them that if they could engineer a vessel to enable them to continue to mine their gold, that would be acceptable, but on a small scale. The Anunnaki had some kind of a falling out with the Atlanteans, and began to conspire with the Syrians and another race referred to as the Serpents. Each of these three races was interested in figuring out how to embody physical planets. They saw Earth as a laboratory of sorts to figure it out. The Anunnaki already had a human uniform. They simply needed to power it with a life source or soul. The bigger issue was how to get the Atlanteans into these embodiments and keep them there. In effect, these three races conspired to enslave the Atlanteans within these pre-human vessels. The Atlanteans were the power generators that made these biological entities operate. Are you saying these primitive ape men had powerful souls inside them? I don't understand how that would be possible. It's a very complicated subject. The Wingmakers wrote about the implantation of programs inside the human uniform, even version 1.0. The Syrians were mostly credited with this invention, but it was the offspring of Anu that really perfected these implants by programming them. The human uniform version 1.0 was designed by the Anunnaki, the implants were designed by the Syrians, and the programming of the implants was designed and evolved by a being known as Marduk. Anu is the leader of the Anunnaki. He was known as the Sky God, in Mesopotamian times. The Anunnaki were the deities written about on the Sumerian text, known as the Royal Blood. That doesn't answer my question as to how a powerful soul would suddenly be plugged into an ape-man vessel and behave like, like a Neanderthal. Well, first, these were much more primitive than Neanderthals. But the answer is in the implants. You see, the biological entity or ape-man, as we're referring to it, was not able to operate in the physical world. They needed survival skills, how to eat, how to hunt, how to clean themselves, how to even move their bodies. All of these very fundamental functions were necessary to actually include or program into the vessel which was the purpose of the functional implants. The implants were akin to the brain of the human 1.0, but it wasn't just in the brain. These implants were placed inside the body within various parts, like the chest area, middle back, wrists, ankles and so forth. The primary ones were contained in the skull. But generally these implants were networked to operate from the head or brain area. Why do you say the head or brain area and not simply the brain? Because it wasn't in the brain. Remember that human 1.0 was still part etheric and part physical. The implants also needed a similar consistency or sound vibration. They were placed into the bone or skeletal structure mostly, and some in the muscle tissue. These functional implants fused into the muscles and bone, including the DNA. The wing makers put it this way, the DNA integration was for the intelligence of the plan. The muscle tissue allowed the life essence to power the functional implant. There was a central coordination point, and that was in the brain, but the implants were located throughout the body. This was an integrated system that was installed in the human uniform to allow it to be controlled, monitored, and programmed over time. It was the evolutionary stick and carrot. Doing it this way allowed the early humans to dig out gold, which, as I said, was their primary purpose initially. I'm sorry to sound like a broken record, but I still don't get how such an advanced race as the Atlanteans could power these ape men and become slaves. It doesn't make sense to me. You have to understand that the implanted functionality was partly to make the human 1.0 and its power source, the life essence of an Atlantean, to function efficiently and effectively as miners. That was the prime goal. The second, however, was to suppress the power source, or in this case, the Atlantean beings inside the human vessels. He did this by making the power source ignorant of its origin and the reality of its true expression as an infinite being. 
when the Atlantean beings were placed inside the human uniform, they were essentially 100% focused on physical survival and functional performance. There were no relationships, no marriage, no reproduction. These were essentially cloned beings. They were all the same in terms of their appearance and abilities. Human drones, piloted by implanted functionality that the Atlantean beings inside became associated with, as them. The infinite inside the body believed it was the body and the implanted functionality, and nothing more. What happened when they died? Let me be clear, these beings, the Atlanteans, were infinite, meaning they did not have space-time regulation. They lived after the body died. However, the Anunnaki created a set of planes or dimensions of experience that was the equivalent of a holding plane, that's what the wing makers called it, where they could be recycled. Recycled as in reincarnation? Yes, later on this became the basis of reincarnation. It allowed the Anunnaki to recycle the Atlanteans. Some aspects of the implanted functionality were interdimensional, which is to say, it could assist in the delivery of the beings to the proper location within the holding planes of consciousness, and assist in their reincarnation back into a new vessel. But you said that they the ape men didn't have reproduction? Not in version 1.0. These were very basic. But the Anunnaki could create them in large scale, so when one human uniform expired, let's say they had a mining accident, another would be made. These were clones. The ability to self-reproduce came in version 2.0. That was mostly because the amount of effort required to manage this process was enormous, on the part of the Anunnaki. They wanted to create an automated system, something that wouldn't require them to orchestrate all of the variables. So the Syrians helped them to create the implants that could propagate through reproduction. This enabled automation of the recycling of the beings from the holding planes to be born into the physical dimension through a baby. So, this was all automated by programming technology? I don't know, this is too weird. The universe is made up of dimensions that are a result of mathematical equations. It is constructed from mathematics. Some beings understand how to apply mathematical equations to organize and plan space-time. It's all created. This world is created, it's not real. It's a programmed reality. When I say plan, it can also be construed as control of space-time. That is to say, this is a programmed space-time reality. Once you can program space-time reality within a species like humanity, you can program at the individual level of a person, right down to when they itch their nose, if you want to. It's all mathematical equations. I don't know what to say.